Hello and welcome to Stories in History. Today we will be delving into the fascinating history of the world's oldest and Southeast Asia's largest Chinese community in the 17th century. The time period we will be exploring was characterized by significant transformations in Southeast Asia, bringing about a profound shift in China's interactions with the rest of the world. Thank you for choosing to visit my channel for your historical interests, and I hope you will find this video informative and enjoyable. Without further ado, let's dive into the fascinating history of this remarkable community. In 1686, a rebellion was brewing in the Parian, just outside the walls of the city of Manila along the Pasig River. The Parian had been home to Chinese merchants, craftsmen, bakers, barbers, and farmers for nearly a century. A group of disgruntled Chinese residents, enraged by the exorbitant taxes imposed on them, broke into the house of the Spanish constable, killing him and another Spaniard, and then proceeded to raid the house of the Spanish governor of the Parian. Fortunately for the governor, he was able to escape unharmed. Tensions had been mounting for several months prior to the rebellion, as Spanish authorities in the Philippines had noticed an increased number of Chinese ships arriving in Manila that year. In response to the uprising, the Spanish publicly executed 11 of the Chinese attackers and displayed their bodies along the Pasig River. By 1690, Spanish authorities would initiate a decade-long policy of forcibly deporting hundreds of non-Christian Chinese in an attempt to minimize the perceived threat posed by the Chinese to Spanish rule on Luzon. When the Spanish first arrived on the shores of Luzon in 1571, they were greeted by a magnificent sheltered harbor located on the eastern bay at the mouth of the Pasing River. The area was home to a diverse group of people, including native Luzones, Chinese merchants, and Muslim missionaries. The population numbered about 2,000, residing in a sparse cluster of hamlets and villages known locally as Barangay. These communities were each governed by a datu, or chief, who maintained strong ties of loyalty, trade, and friendship with the Sultan of Brunei. Additionally, these cultural and commercial connections extended to Muslim cities in the Jolo Archipelago in southern Philippines, ASEAN Sumatra, the Malaccas in modern-day Indonesia, and Patani on the peninsula of modern-day Thailand. Prior to the arrival of the Spanish in the Philippines, Chinese merchants and travelers had already been present for at least 700 years. However, it was not until the establishment of Manila under Spanish rule in 1571 that the region emerged as the most significant port in Southeast Asia for Chinese goods over the next two centuries. For centuries, Chinese junks had been arriving at the Pasig River, bringing with them commodities such as silk, cotton cloth, ceramics, sugar, and other luxury goods exchanged for local produce. By the 16th century, Chinese commerce abroad was driven by the increased demand for silver as a medium of exchange. During the Ming Dynasty in the 15th century, the rigid tax and labor systems of the previous century gradually gave way to a system where taxes were paid in silver. This shift allowed private commerce, especially in Southeast Asia, to expand rapidly, leading to a more monetized economy in China. While currency exchange had existed for centuries prior, the use of silver currency became more prominent during this period. In southern China, copper coins became more commonly used for everyday transactions, while silver became the primary currency for long-distance trade and payment of taxes. However, the expansion of the Chinese economy outpaced domestic silver production by the 16th century, leading to a shortage of silver within the country. This shortage had significant impact on Chinese commerce abroad and resulted in the reliance on silver imports from the Americas via the Philippines. During the Ming Dynasty, China's population rapidly expanded, leading to a considerable land shortage within the country. The population growth was fueled by the introduction of more robust food crops such as yams and peanuts from West Africa and corn and potatoes from the Americas, which could be grown in unirrigated soil. 
These new crops allowed Landshark peasant families to farm hilly uplands and sustain their livelihoods. To maintain their family income in the context of land shortages, most Chinese families tended to stay rooted in farming while sending excess male labor to work elsewhere. This led to the common practice of young men sojourning or temporarily living away from home. Commercial ports, especially in southern provinces such as Guangzhou, Macau, and Xiamen, attracted large numbers of these sojourners, seeking opportunities to earn a living. Many of these young men also found work on ships traveling to Southeast Asia during the latter parts of the Ming Dynasty. The majority of Chinese people who migrated aboard these ships during this time period came from the coastal areas of southern Fujian. While fewer individuals left China than remained, the number of emigrants was still significant. Most Chinese migrants settled in Spanish-controlled Manila, while others arrived in Sulu, an Islamic sultanate in the southern archipelago of the Philippines. In Sulu, the Chinese became known as Sanglais, meaning merchant traveler or frequent visitor. The term soon spread throughout maritime Southeast Asia. Most of the Chinese migrants arriving in Manila were Hokkien, and came to the city with the intention of staying indefinitely or permanently. They built homes and shops, becoming indispensable to trade between the Spanish and mainland China. The Chinese community in Manila grew and became a hub for servicing Chinese merchants and retailers, eventually expanding to provide services to Spanish and local Filipino populations as well. Chinese migrants maintain connections to China by remitting part of their earnings back to their families in mainland China. Chinese merchants played a critical role in facilitating intra-Asian trade as the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty largely restricted foreign access to mainland China. When the Ming Dynasty fell in 1644, the Qing Dynasty imposed a ban on Chinese maritime commerce due to the perceived threat posed by Ming loyalists in southern China and abroad. Many Ming loyalists subsequently emigrated to Formosa and Vietnam during this period, a topic beyond the scope of this video, but one that will be explored in a later one. In 1683, the Qing dynasty defeated the remaining Ming loyalists in southern China, reducing the perceived threat and leading to the reversal of the maritime ban in 1684. This was primarily due to southern China's heavy reliance on foreign trade and the potential for merchant profits to enhance state revenue. The sudden lifting of the maritime ban led to a massive influx of Chinese junks into Manila from 1685 to 1686, as Chinese merchants sought to take advantage of the newly reopened trade routes. The Spanish inflow of silver mined from New Spain and Peru to the Philippines led to an unprecedented wave of new Chinese arrivals into Manila. Within a few decades of Spain's arrival to the Philippines, Chinese merchants flocked to the city, followed by Chinese immigrants who began to populate the area around the Pasig River. By the end of the 17th century, the Spanish population was about 2,000, while the Chinese population had swelled to nearly 20,000, making them the largest foreign ethnic group on the islands. In 1581, the Spanish authorities became suspicious of the increasing Chinese population in Manila and decided to segregate them to a designated section of the city located outside the Intramuros of the walled city, which was later known as the Parian. They also imposed a curfew on Chinese residents forbidding them from staying within the city walls after sunset and required them to pay twice the tribute paid by native Filipinos in Luzon. Manila was a growing and prosperous city in the 16th century and into the 17th century, attracting not only the Chinese, but also Japanese ships carrying silks, folding screens, fans, and lacquerware. Ships from Malacca, Bengal, Cochin, Ayutthaya, Cambodia, and Borneo all arrived seeking trade in Manila as well. However, the largest and most significant traders remained the Chinese, who arrived in an estimated 30 to 40 junks twice per year, laden with goods from across Southeast Asia as well as mainland China. During the 17th century, Manila had become a cosmopolitan city, hosting diverse communities. 
Filipinos from Luzon tended to cluster in neighborhoods called Arrabales surrounding Manila Bay near the Pasang River. The Japanese residents, mostly traders and some Christians, resided in an area called Dilao, which was administered directly by the Franciscan order, and the Chinese, then called Sangles, lived in segregated neighborhoods across Manila, but most especially near the swampy areas of the Pasig River called the Parian. The Chinese were of utmost importance to the economy of Manila, that when the Spanish colonial authorities ordered their deportation in 1690, they faced heavy pushback. The Chinese lent money to local Filipinos and Spaniards, arguing that they couldn't be deported until their debts were collected. Much of the economy relied on loans from Chinese shop owners in Manila as well. Furthermore, Spaniards realized that the Chinese craftsmen were irreplaceable as they weren't enough Spanish or Filipino craftsmen to replace them. In addition, taxes levied from non-Christian Chinese were a significant source of income for the colonial government, without which it would struggle to sustain itself. The Parian remained a thriving Chinese community well into the modern period, containing hundreds of shops. The Parian would move to several locations throughout its existence. The first one stood in what is today the Arroceros Forest Park located near the Pasig River. After it was burned down in 1583, the Chinese community moved to a location near what is today Luasang Bonifacio, but was ultimately torn down in 1790 to make room for the new fortifications to the Intramuros. Many of the Chinese of the Parian would move to Binondo, which was founded in 1594 by Spanish governor Luis Pérez das Mariñas. It had served as a permanent settlement for Chinese Catholics up until this point. Das Mariñas granted the land to several Chinese merchants who were allowed to live there in perpetuity and tax-free. Anondo would survive into the present and become the official oldest existing Chinatown in the world. Despite the Parian's ultimate demolition, it would have a significant influence on the Philippines, inspiring similarly modeled Chinese sojourning communities throughout the island of Luzon, such as in Papanga and Calamba, another in the Visayas and Cebu City, and several other locations across the Philippines. There would also be Parian counterparts in Mexico within the port city of Acapulco, Mexico City, Puebla, and elsewhere in Latin America. And that ends our story of the Parian in Manila, for the Philippines' first Chinese sojourning community, or Chinatown. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Please consider liking and subscribing, and I'd love to see you in the next video. Thanks and goodbye.